Krista Clark from LaGuardia Community College. Um, our first workshop was a little introduction to ePortfolios. Our second workshop is going to be about implementing ePortfolios. How do we get this started? After we just saw all this cool stuff, um, how do we actually do it in our classrooms, in our programs, and in our institution? So again, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, welcome everybody. At end of Friday afternoon. Thanks for uh, being here on such a beautiful day. Uh, a couple of you were in the previous one. A couple of you are just joining us. For those of you who are just joining us, so you know, um, everything that I presented earlier will be available to you. Um, so you can see that stuff if you are interested. Um, and also, please feel free to ask any questions at any time. Um, we're going to be focusing a little bit on how do you get this started. Um, so if you want to do portfolios, what does it look like? And we're going to touch on a lot of these different issues, which are uh, fundamental to ePortfolio and to successful ePortfolio programs. But before we get started, my question is, what would an ePortfolio look like in your department? So I'd like to ask you to just spend uh, a couple minutes thinking could also be in your course. If you would rather focus on your individual course, that's fine. My questions are, what would an ePortfolio look like in your department or course? What do you want it to do? What would be in it? What are your goals for students? What are your goals for faculty? What are your goals for your institution, if you have them, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the portfolio? How do you connect across departments? And who and what do you need to make this happen? What are you worried about? <laughs> okay, so I'll need just going to give you just about five minutes to sketch some of that out, and then we're going to talk about it. Okay? Can we do it as a group if we're in the same department? Absolutely, you can do it. No, you may not speak to anyone else. You may make no connections. Yeah, if you are here with other folks from your department, that's great. If you're here by yourself, then we're going to talk a little bit about what you want to share from your conversations. Okay? So go ahead and get started. We're just going to take about five minutes for this. Did science and 
I have had later. Yeah, yeah. I have had that. So, so I have yeah, them on the time. I have them on the time. She goes, oh, my God. Let's call back to this. And I'm like, if she can show you, compare to her last Friday, which we have seen, and I'm not great. Right. Also, how she is herself. Um, yeah. 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 But she's just yeah. the first yeah. 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 Okay. I know that was not a huge amount of time. I know that's not a huge amount of time. Just want to get your thoughts flowing because in particular, what I want to capture are your ideas and your questions about how to make it happen. Um, so what's it going to look like? What do you want? And what, what do you want to be in it? And what are your concerns? Who needs to come together to make it happen? What do you have? Yeah. The three of us teach. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 go ahead. The three of us teach calculus. And we have That's terrifying. <laughs> I'm going to hide under the table, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and we integrate technology and writing throughout our curriculum. So, what we were saying that's a very natural place to start with the portfolio so the students. You know, keep the documents of the projects that they're doing, yeah. and it, they would be able to see and reflect on. We would be able to see and reflect on um, their growth, both with the technology and with the writing. And we're the three of us are going to be involved um, with some other people, like in, in physics and engineering. We're going to be involved in a, looking at writing across the STEM courses. Oh yeah. And so this is like just kind of a really natural tie-in to that. Um, but what are our concerns? Well, you know, time, energy, time, sure. um, how, do you, how do you manage another, another thing? You know, we already manage course management systems and, and angel, well, angel is one, but, but you just, you're managing your email, you're managing this, you're managing that. You know, how do you manage one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. Marianne needs to tell her story from her student. Well, I was just, was, I, I was teaching how three this semester, and I was meeting with a student recently um, who was in my Calc 3 class, but I had her in Calc 1 in the fall semester. And I was telling her how I'm giving out the first project in Calc 1 this semester, and she's like, oh. And I said, yeah, I said, I actually still have your project from Calc 1. And I worked your Calc 1 project, so we pulled up on my computer her, because I had my students submit them electronically anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, we pull up her project, and she goes, oh my goodness, look how bad that is. She's yeah. And it's just amazing how she saw firsthand her progression of how she matured as a student, as a math student, but also as a writer, and just you know how she presents herself in the project. And she was just commenting on how quote, bad her first project was. Right. Although I like to reframe that as not bad, no. but how far you've come. Yes. Right. And, that's and how important that is. Exactly. That's what I talked to her about. Yeah. yeah. And that would be amazing to capture in a portfolio where she's that first paper to a later paper, right? Yep. Okay, great. But yes, I hear your concerns about time, and we will we will talk about that. And we'll talk about some of that. Other things that came up, what you want it to be, what your concerns are. I'm the, I'm the easy one because I'm architecture. I know, and you're already <laughs> doing portfolios. Yes. Because you're amazing. I remember from last time. Yes, we, I mean, it's like I said last time. I mean, everything here I can answer fairly simply. Yep. Um, we do it. Um, I don't see time being an issue. I mean, to me, um, what do I need? I need a copy of the next PDFs for the students. That would be about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, literally, what do I need? I just need a piece of equipment that costs about ten thousand dollars, not much. Um, okay. And, and then it software it in. Um, my concerns, you know, when you look at everything that you showed us and your students said, it's student driven. 
Um, my fear is that this is going to be assessment driven, which in five years, if you gave me a portfolio in five years, I'll talk to you about assessment, but my, so my fear is that next week it's going to be assessment driven. Right, and, and I mean, that was part of what I was talking about earlier. I mean, one of the goals, so let me just say, as we're, we're working together this afternoon in this piece of um, the workshop, I designed this to talk about really how you create an e-portfolio program from the ground up, looking at budget, looking at all those sorts of things. For those of you who want to do this on the course level, that might not be as important. So I also want your course questions. If I'm not covering something that you want to talk about, well, literally, how do I start? Just toss it out, okay? Um, because we, I want to answer as many questions of yours as I can. Okay, that, probably that there's no Yes, although I understand it's being recorded for later yeah. conversations. So one of the things I want to say about assessment is at the, at the end of this piece, I'm going to be looking at what makes a successful program. And one of the things that I think really is a hallmark of a successful program is a portfolio that's not just assessment driven. Without giving you names, I can point to any number of assessment driven e-portfolio programs that failed. Because they weren't, how many of you were in the earlier session? Well, we were, we, we were last time. You were last time, yeah. So the, I don't know if you guys remember, but those of you who were just in the session prior to this, Rose Holman's ePortfolio Assessment Program is amazing. It's hugely successful because it's integrated into what they need, right? And so everybody at the institution understands that and it works well. Other institutions that actually could use ePortfolio for Gen Ed or could use portfolios and courses, but then impose only a very mechanistic understanding of assessment on the e-portfolio, tend to be the places where portfolios don't do well, or people don't like portfolios. Because here's the thing, if you're, I understand and we'll talk about faculty concerns about time, there are also student concerns about time. If you're gonna ask students to spend a lot of time and energy in creating these portfolios, what's in it for them? And if what's in it for them is that the, the college wants to assess it for middle states, that's not a reason for them to want to do it. You know, would you, I mean, you don't want to do it for that reason. Why are they going to want to do it? At least you understand what middle states and what assessment is, right? But if you are somebody who's returning to college because you want to start a second career and you're very focused on how that new career is going to put you in a different place career-wise, you don't care about middle states. You, you know, you don't understand the language of accreditation in higher ed. So I think that's an important point. This, when portfolios work well, they can address many different needs, and assessment can be one of them. Right. Um, I wasn't at the earlier session, so perhaps this came up, but who really owns the portfolio? Is it the student or is it the faculty member? Maybe a student doesn't want to have their first English paper in the portfolio because they're embarrassed by it. So, Such a great question. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you weren't in the earlier session. Ask all of your questions. <laughs> um, so, who owns the portfolio is a decision that will be made by your college. And you will determine what it, you know, how you want to approach that question. My advice is that the students own the portfolios. So, at LaGuardia, our students own their portfolios. At the end of their tenure at the college, when they're getting ready to graduate, they can export it and take it with them in a portable format, or uh, they can keep it on the college server and continue to work on it on the college server. Within certain, I mean, we have certain parameters. So for instance, early on in our ePortfolio life, before we figured out all the things we needed to figure out, and I'm sure we still don't have that all figured out, we had a student who was running a small business off of his portfolio. Yeah, that, that couldn't happen. Right, you could have a link to his small business website, but actually to be you know, <laughs> selling things off the college website, not such a great idea. Um, when I say students own the portfolio though, obviously that's a mediated experience. And here's what I mean by that. When students are in my English 99 class, if I am giving them 70% of their final grade based on the portfolio, I need to be able to see the portfolio, right? So it's not, like their Facebook that I do not have any legitimate need to access at all and have no right to ask for. You know, within the confines of the academic relationship, they need to share it with whoever it needs to be shared with 
and they need to be able to put the assignments on that are actually assigned, okay? But in the example that you gave of the, the first writing paper, right, or maybe the first calculus paper, if that student's going on to be an engineer, yeah, at the point at which the student is making a showcase portfolio to show to an employer, I would expect that maybe that calculus one paper isn't on and the basic writing paper isn't on because you want to show your very best work. I mean, think back on whatever your senior project was in your major. Do you want that on the web today? Representing you as a professional? Right? I don't. I mean, I my senior thesis I'm really, really proud of that I wrote as an undergraduate. My undergraduate college actually called me and they wanted to put it on the web because they were digitizing all the secret theses. And I said, there is no way that you can put that on the web with my, like, I, like, like, I don't want people to find out when they Google my name, like, seriously? Like, I'm a professional writer, like, and I write a lot better now than I did when I was 20. Um, so, yes, students need to have the right to do that. There are lots of ways in building an e-portfolio program in your department or within the institution where you can capture pieces of student work over time so you have a record of that first paper and the student agrees that you can have a record of it, but it doesn't have to be on her website, right? Her public presentation. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just want to throw it out there as the lone administrative representative here. <laughs> um, what a heavy burden. I know, I know. We and, to do that. Uh, thank you. But, um, we're still in the discovery phase. This is why Liz is here. This is why we're having these discussions. Um, my feeling that I get in terms of these discussions is that we want to hear what you want. Um, Ellen wants to hear what you want. OAA wants to hear what you want. And none of this is going to be successful unless it's going to be useful to the faculty, if it's going to be useful to the students, it's going to be useful to what, whatever we decide to use it for. So it's important, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation. This isn't just Liz comes and we talk and that's it. It's going to be an ongoing conversation, and it's really important. If you are interested in this and you want to see it in use for your faculty or for your students, to make sure that you join the conversation and make it known what you need it for. Because in our wonderful new uh, language of collaboration that we have here, we really want to get that information from you guys. So that's, that's why Liz is here, and we want to make sure that this is going to be useful for you. Because if we just throw it at you and say, do it, well, of course we'll I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, we want to make sure that it's a collaborative effort. But at a beginning point, you know, and I don't think we've had enough time um, or just focused discussions you know, whether it be among a department um, or whether it be across several departments, because I'd love to hear more. But like, just a, what a portfolio is, to, I, I have a sense of what an, art, <laughs> an architecture portfolio is, but um, it, to me, a starting point for us would just be to have, instead of having in our separate angel courses, like Marianne and I in particular, I think, I don't, I'm not sure what Diana, whether you've done it or not, we just started, because we went through an assessment of our Calc 1, we just started having our students submit their projects in their angel course or over email so that we would be able to go back in at some point in time and pull them out and look at them. Um, and that's going to be very useful to us as we yep. start this writing across the STEM courses. It's going to give us some artifacts to go back to. What's a pain in the neck is that you have to remember what, what semester and what course, and then you have to go in there and um, yeah. So right, and something like an e-portfolio would allow you to create a database mm -hmm. that archives that for you. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's one of the question that I got earlier, which was such a great question, is you know, well, when I look at these, it looks like a website. Well, yeah, the student presentation of the portfolios does look like a website. The big difference is between a website and a student portfolio. One is the privacy levels, right? Because students can, and this is also a question about ownership, um, depending on how you design it, students have can have um, a lot of control about the privacy. So in LaGuardia's system, students can choose to make their portfolios entirely private so that their faculty member is the only one who sees them, right? Or they can decide to share it for the semester with the class, 
or for a particular assignment for two weeks with their peer review partners. Or they can make it public just to the college, but you have to be somebody from LaGuardia with a LaGuardia email address to log in the system to see it, or you can make it public to the World Wide Web. And that's part of the conversation that we have with them. So one difference is about privacy levels. The second difference is the difference between a website and an e-portfolio also has to do with the ability of the institution to archive certain materials, or in some cases, the whole port snapshots of the whole portfolio over time for assessment. And so, I mean, portfolios can ease the exact sort of thing that you're talking about. Because what you're talking about is the version of 15 years ago when we did assessment, and everybody gave you a copy of the research papers from their class, right? So whoever was doing assessment for middle states ended up with like <laughs> these humongous stacks of paper in their office. Well, now we're just, in what you're describing, replacing that with the digital version of it, right? Where like you've got all these files and you're like, like I, how do I sort it? What does it look like? So a portfolio, can, a portfolio system can automate some aspects of that and make it easier to read, easier to manage, easier to, to sample over time. Okay, other concerns or questions or things of what you want it to look like before I move on? Yeah? Okay, I think you have to have more cookies. So you have more <laughs> sugar, so you have more energy of things to say. Okay, so, um, all right, just for those of you who are joining the conversation, uh, very quickly, because I know most of you were in the previous uh, conversation, we talk about portfolios, a couple of useful categories, the course portfolio, which is a portfolio that only happens in one class in one semester, the integrative portfolio, student uh, learning over time across multiple courses, multiple semesters, the showcase portfolio, portfolio that happens uh, usually at the end, graduation, getting ready for transfer, or getting ready for employment. Uh, an assessment portfolio for program review and or to evaluate student competencies. And a learning portfolio um, where students are working on maybe a particular project or a particular aspect of a project. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about portfolios as a program at LaGuardia. So how we got beyond my just deciding that I was going to create websites with my English students, right? How do we move from that to a slightly different um, vision of portfolios? So at LaGuardia, we, um, and I can talk more about the history. I did talk about the history in the previous session, and I talked about it with you guys a little bit last time, but I'm happy to, to talk more about how we got where we are. Um, but it basically has been a 14-year journey at this point uh, to where LaGuardia is. So one of the things that I very much am going to recommend that you do as a next step is begin to look at portfolios, right? You need to find out what do you love, what, what's out there that you love. LaGuardia um, and many, many other ePortfolio campuses, uh, we maintain a robust gallery of our student portfolios. Um, so you can go and you can kind of see them in action. Um, when we were starting this work and we were starting to look at them, this was the mantra that we used. Uh, collect, select, reflect, connect. Um, it's a pretty common mantra now uh, with ePortfolios, but the idea is that a portfolio gives students a place to collect all of their work. From that large online database that a student has of his or her work, their archive, they pull out certain pieces that they want to share with their faculty, with the institution, at different points in time, and then they reflect on it. And they talked a little bit about this in the earlier session that, you know, it's like if I hold this phone up and say to you, I'm using this to time myself, if I hold my phone up and I say, well, here's my phone, you're like, okay, you have a phone, right? But why <laughs> am I showing you the phone, right? Like, what is it? When a student puts a piece up on their website, on their portfolio, we don't know why that's the piece they picked. Is it the piece because it was the thing they're most proud of? Is it the thing they picked because they had the hardest time with it? I don't know why they put it up. So that reflection, the writing about what they're doing, becomes really important because you want to know what is it that they're showing you? What do they think they're showing you? And in many cases, that is what they're showing you. 
Um, and then connect for, and again, this is at LaGuardia, what we're interested in, connecting experiences, courses, co-curriculars, how does that all come together in one package, right? And maybe sometimes there's not a one-on-one -on -one connection. You know, maybe one of my students really likes to play soccer and that has absolutely nothing to do with any other aspect of his curricular or co-curricular life. But maybe sometime it will, right? Maybe, maybe it will happen to connect in some completely bizarre way that in the future he is working on an ad campaign around diversity and it's the World Cup, right? I mean, there could be unusual connections or serendipitous connections that come up. So how do we help students connect what's there and also bring those other aspects of their lives into the course? And this for me is a really important pedagogical point. I am sure like you, I teach a lot of classes. If I taught at a small, tiny liberal arts college where I had small classes and a, and a smaller class load, I would not have the dilemma that I often have, which is I'm in the, LaGuardia's on a weird calendar, we're only in week three of our semester. In week three, I still can't remember all of their names because I go from one class of 30 students to my second class of 35 to my third class of 28 back to back to back, right? So one of the things that happens when I'm having them write about their experiences and try and make some connections is I'm connecting to them, right? So it actually sometimes is great to know, oh, you really like soccer? That's a thing we can talk about when you come into my office as a way to start a conversation. Um, so that connection works multiple ways, not just for them to be making those connections, but also for us to find new ways to connect to them. That sometimes I think gets lost in institutions where we have a huge number of classes to teach and large class sizes. Um, so it, it can become something that helps you know your students a little better. Um, at LaGuardia, we're really focused on lifelong learning, uh, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in a little bit, as well as the ability to make these connections. And I showed uh, this in the earlier workshop, as well as this, and this is the only um, overlap after this, it's all new. Um, we're really interested in reflection and integration, so implicit in our ePortfolio design is a connection between courses, right? From the beginning, implicit in LaGuardia's vision for ePortfolio was the idea that they were gonna be integrating from one course to another. And that was something that we wanted as a goal of our program. Uh, we have specific goals for students. Um, we, written into our plan for ePortfolio, was the idea of student engagement making students into more reflective, self-motivated learners, linking classroom and lived experience, helping them to use portfolios as an e-resume for career and transfer, and building technology and web authoring skills. And as I said earlier, when you're at an institution like Rose Holman or MIT, maybe this isn't a goal for your e-portfolio program. When you're at LaGuardia and some of your students do not have home computers, but are gonna need technological skills to go on the job market, that's an important goal, right? Equally, this idea of linking classroom and lived experience becomes really important. A lot of our students are not traditionally age students. So what were they doing before this? And how does that help to inform the choices that they're making and where they wanna go? And are there connections there that are useful and important um, that we can bring in? And always, I think for all of us, no matter what kind of institution, right? We want those self-motivated learners. We would love when they leave our classroom tonight, uh, this afternoon, for them to go home on a Friday night and study, right? <laughs> Everybody's laughing. Wouldn't you love that in an ideal world? That they go home and they want to study what we've done Not in class? Not on a Friday night. <laughs> Not on a Friday night. All right, on a Monday night, would you like that? Yes, it is. Does that happen on Monday night? I hope so. <laughs> Sometimes, not always, depends, right? But that goal of those self-motivated, more reflective learners. Also, thinking about it this way. We were talking in the earlier session, uh, I started off, a couple of people were wearing Fitbits, which allow you to track your motion and your activity. So for people who wear a device like that, and I wear a Fitbit, I'm really interested in the end of the day of seeing, well, how did I do, and my goal of how many steps I want to take every day. 
right? And, and am I making progress? And how does that fit into my overall health um, goals? Okay, I'm using data to inform myself and how I'm doing. And I'm tracking that because I am motivated to know if I am working towards my goals, right? E-portfolio can work in a very similar way. So students are looking at how they did in that Calc 1 paper and how they're doing in Calc 3. Are they making progress towards their goals? Are there things they need to go back and look at again or look at in a different way or maybe do some extra work? Um, when I am not busy at LaGuardia, which is not very often, um, I am a very avid scuba diver. And right now I'm working on my dive master certification. And one of the things that I am very weak on is in math. Um, my math, my critical literacy skills are not awesome. Um, so I opted to do an additional course called Dive Theory Online because it was an additional 15 hours of study in dive physics and dive theory. Because I really identified that that was an area that I needed more work in if I was going to be able to be more successful with students in the water. You know, that I wanted to be able to talk in a much more informed way than I felt like I could. So using technology and analytics to inform what I need to do differently. Wouldn't we love that if our students and our educational system could support, oh, I'm in Calc 3, but I recognize I still have problems with this issue, so here's a way that I can get better with that. Same with writing, same, right, in all of our disciplines. Like, where is it that we'd like them to dig a little deeper? Portfolios can help them to see that and them to identify that. We also have goals for faculty, and among our goals for faculty include richer understanding of the learning process, so that as students are keeping these e-portfolios, we can really see, as faculty, what are they learning? Are they actually learning what I think they are learning? Are they actually doing the kind of work that I thought this assignment was going to yield? Um, we find that it improves advisement and career guidance, and that's something that is important in our conversations with students. Supporting outcomes assessment by giving more nuanced data than standardized tests. And deeper insight into the meaning of our student diversity. For me, this is a really big one. And I gave a bunch of examples in the earlier session about that. But I think it's really important for us as community college faculty to be able to talk about the importance of what we do. When we talk about that in terms of grades or numbers, that doesn't mean a lot. Not to say that numbers are not important, but that's difficult for external audiences who are not part of higher ed to understand. But when we can tell stories and show examples of how we start with a student here and we bring them through this set of educational experiences and this is where they end up, that's something that I think is really important to add to the public dialogue of higher ed. And I think it's very, very particular to community colleges who we know do not get as much funding as other types of institutions and who are often not resource rich, right? You need a scanner that will make PDF files for your students. That is really serious. I mean, that's a serious resource issue. I could point to any number of those kinds of issues on my campus. But one of the ways that we can elevate that conversation in higher ed is by getting better as faculty about talking about what we do, right? And one of the ways we can do that is not just by saying, oh, well, all of our students get A's, right? Because what's the comeback to that? If the comeback is all your students get A, you know, all your students get A's is the statement, what's the pushback? Great inflation. <laughs> Great inflation, right? You just gave them all A's. Yes. But if what you can do is say, well, here's the Calc 1 paper, you don't have to say the name of the student, right? And obviously, if the student's name to student's permission to share that, here's the Calc 1 paper. Here's the research paper the student wrote in a STEM field right before she transferred to Rochester. Well, that is a very powerful narrative. And even more powerful, if the student can narrate that, right? If the student is in control of that narration and then chooses to share that. Um, so I think that for faculty, this becomes a, a really important and I think under-discussed part of the portfolio. I am much better positioned to talk about what LaGuardia does as an institution because of our use of portfolios. Because I'm not just talking about my class. I can give you anecdotes about my classes all day long. I love to teach. I love my students. Um, but I can talk about them 
but then I can put it into a much larger frame of talking about the kind of work that we do. And I think that's really important. So when we first started portfolios, the very beginning, uh, we were focused on course-based portfolios. So we had, at our very first pilot semester in 2003, a single set of courses in learning communities. So we had uh, faculty who self-identified that they wanted to participate. And I should say, um, when we started portfolios at LaGuardia, our first year was a research year where we were researching how portfolios were done across the nation. And then we wrote a white paper looking at and making suggestions for how we wanted to implement them on campus. Then we had um, a year where faculty could volunteer to be in the ePortfolio program and just experiment like crazy. And anything that could go wrong went wrong. And then our first like formal institutional step was this in our learning communities. But this does exist in a context, remember we're back in 2001, 2002, 2003. LaGuardia was transitioning to Blackboard for the first time. And at that time, um, I was a new hire in 2000. And in my department in English, the next closest person in terms of promotion and tenure was a brand new full professor. There were no associate professors, and the only other assistant professors were the ones who were hired with me. So we had, and CUNY had this large gap in hiring for several years. So there were also some generational things that were going on in terms of people's comfort with technology at that time. So the institution um, hired Brett Einan, who some of you saw in the previous video, and some of you are familiar with his name now because his work with ePortfolio was just phenomenal. Brett came into the institution and designed, he had previously been with the American Social History Project, and his work was in technology and curriculum. So they hired him to come in to be the brand new director of our Center for Teaching and Learning, and to direct a brand new program called Designed for Learning, which was to get faculty comfortable with technology in the classroom. So in 2003, when we really began to do ePortfolio, we had a cohort of faculty who had come through Design for Learning, which was a year-long seminar that was run 2000, 2001, 2001, 2002, 2002, 2003. And so those faculty were already comfortable with technology and importantly, comfortable with the fact that anything could go wrong. Like they weren't going to panic when things went wrong with the technology because they had been immersed in this conversation around technology and um, curriculum. So that faculty was our pilot faculty here. Um, and so they came in. So in the beginning, and this was really important because we were still trying to decide on our vendor. We were still trying to figure out what our platform looked like. There was a lot of this that was really up in the air. So we needed people who were going to be really comfortable in the classroom when things went wrong, right, in the beginning. And they weren't going to throw their hands up and just give up. Instead, they were going to come back to the community of other faculty and say, here's what went wrong, here's what I think we should do, here are my suggestions, or I don't know what my suggestions are, what do you guys think we should do? So we really worked together. So at the same time, we had this going on in learning communities for students, the faculty, the ePortfolio faculty, really formed a very, very tight community of practice. Um, we met regularly in a seminar, but we also knew that we could depend on one another as resources to build this. Then over time, we moved beyond that model, beyond the single set of courses, into ePortfolios in courses throughout the curriculum, building up to capstone portfolios. So where we are today is that students, and we are completely overhauling our entry point for portfolios as we speak. Uh, we have just launched a major new first year experience initiative that is in um, pilot stages in different departments this year. And that will be the entry point for ePortfolios. So all students will begin their portfolios in a department or major related first year experience course taught by faculty who are comfortable with ePortfolio. Um, and that's where they're gonna start their portfolios. So is that, is that uh, something like an introductory seminar? Yes, is yeah, like a first year seminar. So did you have that before? Or are you just reintroducing it? We had a version before that was in these learning communities. Okay. And this but has not, to do as you not in programs. 
Yeah, not it was not program specific. Okay. It was a, a course called New Student Seminar okay. that was taught by our um, advising faculty. Oh. We've gone through some restructuring, mm -hmm. so those faculty have been assigned back to departments or gone to other places um, or had a complete reformulation of their job, which had to do with institutional uh, restructuring changes. So now what you're introducing is a tad majority seminar within programs. Correct. And so this is the calling of us now. Yes. Okay. Yep. Because as you were talking about it earlier, that's the most probable place I've been thinking that I could use this. Because that's that's why. Yeah. Pictable. Starting with them early. Yeah. Right, you capture all of their early growth, right. all of their early stuff, yeah. but it also begins to focus them very early on the idea of their education as a journey yes. and that there are going to be these milestones, yes. right? So we're moving to portfolios being in that first year. Then we have different milestones, which I was explaining before in the assessment, where departments and majors choose the courses where they're going to collect and work with the portfolio and then we end with a capstone portfolio. So we've got it all the way along in their, their educational career. And I think one of the keys to our success is that we really consider this a college-wide project. So to do portfolios the way we do them at LaGuardia takes a lot of pieces, and there are always a lot of moving parts, which makes it really complicated. We're a huge institution. Um, we have depends on the semester because our FTEs, you know, up a little, down a little, but on average, between 17 and 18,000 FTEs every semester, right? So in any given year, we're talking about 34,000 portfolios. Those are a lot of pieces to manage on the ground. Yes, I just was wondering, who monitors those? There's got to be some type of monitoring for the portfolios that are appropriate, all somebody has to that obviously at somebody has that job right no one person has that job that that job begins with faculty because most of most of what is going on in the portfolios it comes out of classes that's not to say there are students who add their own stuff outside of classes because they want to um, which is great they're their portfolios um, but we really depend on faculty as the front line for talking about that kind of stuff so yes in my Composition one courses these days. I have a whole section that I devote to talking about visual images and how you know you can use those images and, and not because I consider that part of authoring in the 21st century, right? That's a that is part of being a writer in the 21st century is you're going to use images on your blog or your website. So I've pulled that into my course. They're also going to hear that in other courses from other disciplinary perspectives. So what happens is if a student uses an image that they shouldn't have used, usually that's going to be caught by faculty members who are reviewing the, um, the assignment, right? Or faculty members who are reviewing a portfolio where the image might appear as not part of an assignment, but I'm looking at the whole portfolio, and so I'll say, hey, I'm not so sure about why doesn't that image have a credit? What's going on there? Um, so that's not to say that a student might not, for a period of time, have an image on a portfolio that they don't have permission to use, but hopefully at some point as the faculty are reviewing it in different courses, that comes up. We also have a very large uh, e-portfolio staff who are regularly looking at portfolios. They're not specifically charged with reviewing them for that kind of stuff, but when they are looking at the portfolios and something comes up, then they work with faculty, work with the chairs, work with you know whoever the appropriate avenue is to address that. So, I'm not going to put this very nicely. Yep. The, the portfolio is basically mostly on the program. So you, I mean, so at the end you're looking at a program coming out and directing what goes into the portfolio. For. <coughs> so when you were originally talking, you said your class go do what each faculty go do what you want. In the end, you're not really interested in doing that. I mean, so it, it's, it's, depends it's, on the major. Well, so in okay, liberal arts, as, as the major, yep. let's say architecture. Okay. I would not want, I would not want English 101 teachers to go off on their own and start posting into the students. 
I would not want English 101 professors necessarily to have a portfolio requirement that would become part of this because we are a very diverse faculty. Some know, some know what angel is, some think it's the thing on your shoulder. You know. um, so I may literally say, as part of your portfolio, I'll say what I, when I want you to include an English 101 paper. I'll say when I want you to include a math 132 part of it. I don't want the individual faculty to direct that. I want the program to direct when it comes in. Yep, okay, I got you. So again, that's gonna look really different campus by campus, and that's gonna depend on the decision you make as a campus. Well, which one's more successful? Either of those can be successful. Here's how it works at LaGuardia. So at LaGuardia, if you're in the nursing program, right. nursing has a very, and phys, nursing and physical therapy and education have very strict templates that they have worked on with wherever students are going next, whether it's to an HR department to get a job or they're transferring to Queens College right, for uh, transfer in a major. Those three programs have very strict templates. But what happens is the students take English 101 with me two semesters before they're working on that template. So a student might have a 101 paper on their portfolio when they get to nursing, when they get to the nursing capstone course, say. But then the nursing faculty member will work with them to decide whether or not that's appropriate in the portfolio for a job in nursing. Because if it's a research paper on Shakespeare, right, that's not appropriate. So then the student will take it off. But so how, I mean, you obviously have too much more old faculty who don't use technology. So what happens to that student who then comes into nursing? And yeah, so regardless of whether faculty are actively using technology, like I teach in a computer lab half time with my students, regardless of whether students are doing that or not, there are designated points in the curriculum where we are collecting work in the e-portfolio for assessment and where students are working with portfolio. So one of the new places that that will happen is in the new first year seminar in the major. Okay, okay. so you're in your first year seminar and you're all in all 90 classes. You're well, you're creating the portfolio in your first year seminar. Right, so where, how do you force, how do you force that English 101 paper to show up if it's not within the English 101 teacher? We collect it, so, the, so I was previously the director of the writing program, and so I would send out a memo and say, it's time for depositing into the ePortfolio database. Um, I want you to work with your students. Here are the directions on how to do it if you're in a lab and you're already having students create portfolios. If you are not actively doing that this semester, here is who you call to get someone to come to your classroom to make that happen. So our ePortfolio staff then will come in work with those students and that faculty member to make sure that the 101 assignment is represented in the database. How did that go? I mean, That's that part of, that was part of our assessment plan. And I mean, again, this is why it has to work out on your campus. That we had middle states, we were critiqued for our assessment plan, we had to do a, the five year interim report to middle states, and ePortfolios went through faculty governance. They went through our entire faculty governance system and this is what we decided we were going to do for assessment. And did it go so the union governance? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We are yeah. Okay. You're CUNY, we're CUNY. <laughs> I know. Yes, absolutely. Because I mean, you're, so, just, you're dictating essentially what goes into the class then. You're dictating No, the we're di well, yeah. as you know, I mean every course has learning objectives, right? And every course which I'm assuming are agreed on by curriculum. So it's one of the, I mean, it's one of the items from your learning objectives. So we're not, for instance, I teach my English 101 course, varies by semester what my topic is gonna to be. This semester it's a digital, uh, establishing your digital identity in a technological world. Cool. So yeah, I think it's totally fun. We're reading Cory Doctorow's Little Brother. Their research paper is going to be on the young adult novel, Cory Doctorow's Little Brother. All of my students are going to deposit that paper into assessment. It will also be on their e-portfolios, which I'm grading at the end of the semester. Okay, so it's going to be both. Remember, I talked about both parts of the system. That research paper will show up in both parts of the system, both in our database and on their personal portfolios um, by December seventh. Yeah, no, I guess I mean the biggest part, the biggest, but best, 
bottom of the list there was the biggest where you send out the email to every English 101 teacher that says we're going to come into your classroom if you don't know how to do this and do this with you. To, to give you the to give you the support because well so so let's say important. you are in my friend Jason's class. My friend Jason's English 101 is on sci-fi, right? So that's their focus. So I I'm, I don't know, but I'm imagining their research paper is probably on aliens, the movie, because he wrote a book on aliens, the movie. Okay? okay. So they're not doing the same research paper my students are doing. They're doing a totally different project. But because we're both teaching 101, we teach the research paper. And the research paper is what the English faculty have decided is the item we're collecting. So now let's say, I'm sure you can't relate to this at all. We hired an adjunct the day after courses began, who's never taught at LaGuardia, who is now teaching English 101, okay? That person can't say, oh, I don't have to do assessment because it's part of our agreed upon curriculum. It's gone through governance and it's what the English department faculty have decided on is that's the piece we're collecting. So what we say to that person is, this is part of what we have agreed on. So if you don't know how to do it, we'll help you figure out how to actually collect it. But you don't get to not teach a research paper because that's one of the course outcomes. You don't get to say it's not going to be portfolio because that, that is our assessment plan. But it all went through, what I'm trying to say is that because it went through governance, because it's gone through the faculty have decided what's going to be collected, it's not like anybody came in and said, this is the thing you're doing. We decided this was the thing we were doing. I mean, there are other ways to do assessment other than e-portfolio. So we could have, as a faculty, decided that we wanted to go another route. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Before, but I just... All right, well, I just want to make sure, like, because I'm sure for some people who come in, who are hired the day after classes begin, right, it might feel like there's not a lot of choice about it, but the fact of the matter is, there is, within the institutional community, there has been a long history, a long dialogue that led up to this point. Yeah, I don't, I, mean, I don't think it's the one who was hired the day after class has started. I think it's the one who was hired, say, four miles ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's the issue. Right. right, but that person has been part of the conversation. Not if they're <laughs> Well, it depends on how the conversation is structured and it depends on how the conversation is, is approached. So at LaGuardia, I mean, one of the things we do is we have very rigorous professional development to make this happen. Um, traditionally, our professional development seminars are year-long seminars, um, although we're experimenting with some new models. Those are open to all faculty, including adjuncts. That's really important to make this work, right? And it's paid professional faculty development. So faculty get a stipend or get a course release for and that's really important because you want everybody to be part of a conversation. Um, so, I mean, I think that is important. It's integrated in the curriculum in the ways that, that I've talked about. Every department decides where they want to interact with the portfolio. In liberal arts, which is one of the majors that I teach in, we do not have a standard capstone e because we decided that we didn't want that. So every, every LIB 200 ePortfolio looks very different. But if I'm teaching in nursing, the nursing faculty have decided that they're gonna follow you know, a very specific template. So it's integrated into the curriculum, but that curriculum is really decided on by the faculty and what they want it to look like. Um, it's also integrated in the classroom as part of the pedagogy, and that's not random. That is, in faculty professional development seminars, we talk about well, what does an e-portfolio assignment look like? How do you create it? What do you need to make that effective? What are some examples? Okay, write one. Okay, go try one. Okay, how did it work out? Um, okay, do you want to make any changes? Right? And part of that work in the faculty development is making it low stakes. Because if you're trying something new, things aren't always going to go well. They're not always going to go well the first time. Sometimes they're not going to go well the second time. So you need to build in lots of room and encouragement for failure and support to help people get it where they want it to be, right? So that it becomes not an, oh my gosh, I messed this up and everybody's looking at me and it's terrible. It becomes, a, oh, this is a learning moment. What can I learn from this and how can I make it different? Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, 
so many things happening. Yeah, yeah, go. <laughs> Tell me all the things, all the things in your brain. I want to know. Okay, so um, I come up with an idea, my colleagues and I come up with ideas, and we go, we just love these ideas for calculus, and we want our students to keep them in portfolio, our calculus students for that. And then somebody in engineering says, you could never, you brought, you can yeah, do this. Somebody, because you said Math 132, so somebody in engineering says, well, I want a new portfolio for my students that looks at this, and I want all of the calculus teachers to put, to have their students put this artifact in their portfolio. Okay, so one of my questions is, can a student have multiple e-portfolios? Like, in other words, I don't necessarily care about and I'm not picking on Dave, but, <laughs> but I don't really no, care. That, that was kind of what I was Yeah, thinking. I don't really care what Dave wants in his, his <laughs> equipment. <laughs> um, I want it for something else. And I don't want to have to look. I'm only kidding you because I really do want to see you. <laughs> I don't want to look at Dave's portfolio just to go in and see what I wanted from my students. Yep. Nor do I necessarily want him to come in and look at what I'm, you know, and I'm not yep. trying to say So, that. remember the list I showed you of all the different kinds of portfolios that you could have? The course yeah. portfolio. Have students keep a math portfolio, right? Like for whichever, Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, that's a course portfolio. And remember, you're not going into anybody's portfolio. You're going okay. into student's portfolio. You're not going into his portfolio. So you would bring up, yeah. Okay, but I, okay. Oh, okay. Would, would I see, like I, I have my health one. That's a conversation, that's a conversation you're gonna have with your students and it's a conversation you're gonna have with your colleagues about how you wanna handle it. So let me tell you, in my English 101 class this semester, my students have to keep a portfolio for my class. They have a choice, and their choice is people who already have, I'm talking about students who come in with a portfolio. They can either create a brand new portfolio that is just English 101. It's only gonna have English 101 stuff on, or they can add an English 101 page, think about like sub page, yeah. to the portfolio they already have. And I'll go there. So you're just going to go into that page? Well, if they share the whole thing with me, because I'm me, I'm going to look at everything. <laughs> Not to say your assignment should come off, but because, as I said, our faculty are kind of the front lines of looking at stuff. So I am going to look at images. I am going to look at, not in a way that um, like I'm not going to go into the math paper and try and grade the math paper, but I might look at the about me statement that they wrote their first semester and say, did you really want to put a picture of yourself in a bikini? Because I'm not sure if that's the message you want to be sending. This is not related to what I'm grading on your English 101 paper. This is a by the way, you know. So it's a it's a conversation and a dialogue about that. So I am going to look. I am going to look at the whole portfolio. Um, not because I'm going to regrade the math work, because everybody would just get an A. Um, you know, <laughs> like that's not going to happen. Um, but I am going to look at the whole thing. I might have some comments on the aesthetic look and feel, the color, the color template. I may make some suggestions. You know, the bright pink with lime green font, not really very friendly to look at. Here are some suggestions. But what I'm going to be grading is the English 101 page. Or if they create a whole portfolio that's just for 101, then I'll be grading whatever it is that they're giving me for 101. So if remember you this say grade. Okay. Yep. Does the grade show up um, in any portfolio? Are you grading online or are you grading it privately? Ah, great question. So remember, the portfolio is the students, right? So when I'm grading it. I am grading it in a way that they're getting the grade, not on the portfolio, right? Or in some cases, I have some semesters, and again, this is a little technical. In our ePortfolio system, you can create a private page. 
So sometimes I've created a private page that I share with the students where their grade goes, but nobody else can see it because it's just shared between the two of us. Um, but again, some of that has to do with software and how you want to set it up. But no, you're not, when I say you're grading the portfolio, you're not, you're giving them the grade as a narrative or a rubric or however it is that you're delivering grades, not on the portfolio itself. So do you ever have students um, after you grade your assignment go back and rewrite it and then post the improved version on their portfolio? Or is well, that's a requirement for my class. Okay. So because I, because in the writing class, that's what I want to see. So I collect all of their early versions. I grade all of their early versions. Then they have to revise it based on what I say and what their classmates say. And then they have to post the improved version and a letter telling me what they did to make it better. But um, I have not had, I mean, just anecdotally, too many students who have, let's say, taken a final version and gone back and re-edited it later. I've had one or two when students were transferring and they wanted, you know, they knew that they had gotten this piece wrong or that piece wrong and they wanted to show that it was something they were able to do. Um, and it, you know, I mean, in which case, I revised my own stuff. I don't see a problem with that because the record, the, the grade of record is still on their transcript. But all of this is a is an institutional conversation. Mm -hmm. If we decide that we want to have it as a course portfolio or um, integrated portfolio, that is a conversation we would have. Absolutely. And, a decision we and you make. should. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. How we do it at LaGuardia mm -hmm. shouldn't be the cookie cutter of how you do it. I hear that, but I'm saying we have the, the technology available to do it anyhow we want, and it's not like the portfolios are this nope. rather than That's this. Right. That's right. And, and for example, San Francisco State that I showed you in the earlier workshop, every department does portfolios in a totally different way. They don't even use the same software, mm -hmm. right? Every department chooses the software they want to use. So I mean, it can be as varied as that. At Salt Lake City Community College, the students choose the software they're going to use, right? So I mean, it it can look very different by institution and should, because there are very different issues driving what it looks like on each campus. Just but say, please have a discussion about like what type of software you want to use, because having a zillion of them across campus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the discussion. <laughs> having having every department choose its own software. What, came about as a very specific compromise that San Francisco State had to make to make portfolios happen on their campus. Is that necessarily the, I mean, their e-portfolio director, who is one of the nicest, most amazing people you ever meet in your life, spends a huge amount of her time trying to figure out, you know, like, okay, well, what video do you need for your students for screenshots, and what do you need? And, you know, her time goes to that rather than to other things. That's a decision they make. You have to make the right decision for you guys. So I have a question. So like now, I, I teach an introductory seminar, and my students have to submit an ordinary portfolio, which has almost all of you, what you said, reflection, and all this sort of stuff. They have to do this. Um, and it's a one credit hour. So how did you find integrating portfolio into your coursework, how did you, how did it, did it add to number of credits? That's what I'm saying, because now I'm asking my students to take another step. And what I already do is worth one credit. Did you find that you have to uh, make yeah, your courses additional credits? Um, I think this, the answer to this would certainly vary by person and by institution that you asked. Here's my answer for my classroom. My answer for my classroom is no, because I let go of other stuff. Oh. Right? I made I looked okay. at what I was doing mm -hmm. and I decided that for me, as somebody who's teaching composition, mm -hmm. I really needed to make sure that my students were digitally literate in writing digitally, because that's what they're gonna have to do in jobs and future courses. So there were other things that I did before that I let go in order to do this. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if it was not an add-on for me yeah. over time it was a figuring out what I used to do 
that was important then that wasn't as important now. Right? So it was a prioritization. So it was still worth the one credit hour. Yeah. For us, it's three. But right. yeah. Right. right. And that's part of my answer to you about the time issue is absolutely portfolios take time. I, they do. And anybody who says they don't, I would love to see how they're doing portfolios. Um, you know, but for me, it's a question of if this is a road you want to go down, then how do you figure it out so it makes sense with what you're doing? I mean, in the earlier seminar and the workshop that you guys heard um, earlier this year, and I was talking about how cultural pressures are changing the classroom. Right now, I'm um, on a, a working group for AAC and U where we're working on a white paper about Gen Ed um, that is going to be released um, next year. And I'm on the technology committee. And one of the things we have spent a lot of time talking about is how higher ed is going to change in the next 10 years because of technology. And one of the things that's going to change is that idea of extending the classroom, right? Like stu you can. Students can get more outside of the classroom. So how do you facilitate that as the person who is responsible for the curriculum? What does that look like? And what are those, what does that change look like? And one of the things that, that we've been talking a lot about, and I don't know what it will look like in its final format, but we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that, you know, people are gonna have to look at their courses and make some decisions about what is a way we've always done things, but isn't necessarily way we need to keep doing things and what are things that we absolutely need to keep doing right we cannot have biology students I would argue we cannot have biology students never have dissected something if they're going to become doctors right they need to understand how things work that seems to be an important component of the the biology curriculum as it exists today that should not be changed there needs to be that lab and that hands-on portion are there other pieces that the pedagogy and the curriculum could look different. Maybe. I'm not a biologist, it's not my not my area, but as a, an example that's not English, it's something we need to think about. So when I approached portfolios, e-portfolios, that's something that I was thinking about. Other questions? I have more stuff I'm to show you, but I wanted to come back. All right, I know there's all this stuff in your head. I want all the stuff in your head. I'm, I'm coming back to this idea, you know, I'm hearing, okay, lots of professional development that makes sense to me you know you had your pioneers that makes a lot of sense to me I like to call them spelunkers <laughs> by the way <laughs> um, but I guess I get it um, but I'm, I'm picking up on something Dave said that even though it went through governance and it went through the union the e-portfolio system that you have seems to now have mandated that every faculty member then participate. Am I correct? Let's say almost every, and the reason that I want to say that is that we do sample from stuff, right? So when I have 120 sections of English Composition 101 every semester, I don't have to have 28 students in every one of those sections deposit in order to have everything be successful, right, for assessment. Um, so there are programs where they have made a decision about how they're going to sample their faculty um, that was a departmental decision. So for instance, the question about English 101, one of the things that we decided was we went back to our dean and said, do we really need that number of papers every semester for the, for the critical literacy database? And he said, no, we would never read all of those papers. So we said, okay, well, we have 75 faculty who teach in computer labs. Can we collect from them? Just logistically, because we don't know how we're gonna get people who don't teach in a computer lab in. And he said that would be fine. So that was a change that we made in the middle of our middle states. But then, as we were moving forward, then we moved to this first year experience model. So the first year experience model, now we will be collecting from everybody. So one of the challenges is figuring out what to do when you're not in the computer lab, right? There are like decisions and conversations that we've made along the way, um, trying to deal with the, real, the reality of on the ground. So one of the realities of on the ground is we don't have computer so how do you, you know, how do you handle that? 
if you have somebody who doesn't know how to use a computer. One other question. Is there still an anonymity factor when you are talking about assessment and you have your faculty dumping their papers in and when you go and select the papers? Um, yep, I know what you're asking. So yeah. there, are, there are three answers to that. The first answer is if everybody deposited papers exactly the way we've outlined in the instructions, yes, we can have 100% anonymity in pulling the papers. Because the first step is supposed to be that all the faculty information is stripped and the student information is stripped from the paper so that what is deposited is a paper that just has the plain court English 101, but not the section number, and then the title of the paper, and then the paper, right, the paper itself. Um, students and faculty routinely forget to strip that. So often, we do know that it's this student in so-and-so's class. But there's no way that we're <coughs> using that data. We're always looking at the data whole. So there, we're not coming back and saying, but in your class, you did this. That's not how we're using it. We're saying, when we look at English 101, we're finding that we had a 0.88 increase. Or we're finding that 700 students plagiarized, so maybe we need to be emphasizing you know, <laughs> plagiarism in our courses. So it's about how the data is being used. But yes, I do see faculty names and student names on paper. So that's answer one. So answer one is, if everybody was doing it the way they were supposed to be, I should be able to look at papers that have no identifying information. That does not have to do with um, how we have set up the system. That has to do with people's ability to follow through with the instructions that they're given. Welcome to the world, right? Answer two is, it does depend on what program you're in. Because some programs, nursing, um, education, physical therapy, Fine arts, um, there are a couple others. A couple of our business uh, majors have decided the capstone portfolio is going to be a graduation requirement for the program. Not for the college, but for the program. And they are assessing the whole portfolio. Well, then they know who the students are, right? I mean, they know who the students are because that's how they're assessing them. So in those cases, yes. But in liberal arts, we made the decision that we didn't want to do that, so not in liberal arts. Um, so it depends on your major, is the second answer. The third answer is when we went through our most recent middle states, so the anonymity question, which I think is really important to bring up at this point in your process, it's really, really important. When we first did ePortfolios, our faculty was absolutely up in arms about the fact that this had to be anonymous. It had to be. And they, it wasn't going to pass governance if it wasn't anonymous. Fine. We created a process that made it anonymous. And really important, we have been completely transparent all the way through. And I say this as somebody who's on the assessment leadership team who designed with Digication that assessment system. I mean, I sat with our vendor and said, here is what I needed to do. And then they would come back and show and I, you know, here is what I need to happen when I press this button. And that's what happens. I was one of the people who was involved in that conversation at that level. We have done exactly what we promised faculty we were going to do. So I can stand up in a faculty meeting and say, with a completely clear conscience, here's what you asked for, here's what the system does, here's how we've used the data. So this has been used completely the way that we said. That was really important because nobody understood how assessment data was going to be used. Nobody understood how e-portfolios were going to be used, and there was a lot of fear on campus when we started this in 2001. Fourteen years later, we have a 14-year track record of no one has been fired for assessment data, right? No one, that assessment data has not been used in that way, and we have programs who have elected on their own to use the integrative portfolio as the way that they want to assess student work for a graduation requirement, so now we're having a conversation about moving to integrating the, to assessing the whole portfolio as an institution. Like that that's what we're going to use. But that's a conversation that happened over time. We had to start there. We had to start, we had to deliver what we promised, 
We had to show how we were going to use it. We had to have a track record of showing that's how we were going to use it before we could get to this other point. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think <clears throat> assessing the whole portfolio integratively is a much better way to go. Looking at random samples of student work that I pull from the portfolio doesn't tell me as much as looking at the whole portfolio. I know that as a faculty member, you know, when I look at my student's whole portfolio. But that, that can't be where you start the conversation. You have to start the conversation wherever the conversation around assessment is on your campus. And that varies by campus. And it varies by what the assessment conversation has been and, and where it's going. Does that make sense? What, I guess this is two separate questions, but how does this work with new hires? And I imagine that it works very differently if you're hiring a full-time person and if you're hiring an adjunct. That is, how do you, what kind of training and support is there? Adjuncts usually don't get any. We have, our faculty professional development seminars are open to everybody. We don't distinguish between full time and part time. Show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They get paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, that depends on how it's built in. Um, I know we're almost out of time, so I'm available to keep answering questions. But let me just show you a couple of other things, um, and let me also point you to a couple of things. So one thing is. This whole presentation is going to be available to you. Um, Chrissy will get it out to you. So you have it, and you can email me any questions that you have about it. Um, what I would like to point to is, and I've given you this at the end, is the Catalyst for Learning. This is a brand new site um, that was just published online in January that came out of three years of research by several of the major institutions who've done ePortfolio in the country. LaGuardia spearheaded this, Brett Einan spearheaded the project. And what is on this website it are the different components of ePortfolio and successful ePortfolio programs. And every institution has a story. So let's say you're interested in knowing more about assessment at Salt Lake Community College. Go to Outcomes Assessment and click on Salt Lake, and you will read their assessment story. Or let's say you want to know about professional development seminars at LaGuardia. Well, one, you could just talk to me. But <laughs> you could go here and click on this, and then click on LaGuardia. And there's a narrative, and there are examples of the kinds of things that we do. Um, so this is a really, really, really rich resource. There are 24 different campuses. Um, some campuses have provided stories in every area. Some of them have done stories just in the areas that they felt they were particularly strong in. It's a great resource. Um, the other thing that I want to point to, which um, we don't have time to go through, and I don't think it's as important for the conversation we needed to have, but I do think it's an important piece for you to have, <laughs> is if a portfolio program is going to be successful on campus beyond a single course, these are the elements that are involved, right? So pedagogy, technology, shared leadership, resources, mission and goals. And then that goes through you know, different components that are involved. But basically pointing to what I said before, that LaGuardia's approach has really been a whole college approach. So when you talk about something like assessment, that really came out of a shared leadership conversation about what we needed it to look like, what faculty were comfortable with, what the administration felt we needed to get through middle states, what students were going to be able to produce, and what that was going to look like, um, as one example. Another example is the vendor that we are currently with. We started with a homegrown platform that we knew was never going to be able to support us all the way through our implementation. We went to a, a, vent, a commercial vendor um, in 2003, and they never delivered the assessment piece that we needed. So we had to go to a new vendor. Uh, we switched new vendors a couple years ago, uh, be specifically because we needed the assessment piece because we weren't going to be ready for middle states. But we worked with faculty, staff, students, IT uh, to figure out what all of our requirements were for a brand new platform. And so what we have is definitely a compromise. Everybody didn't get everything they wanted, but it was a really good faith effort in trying to get as many of the pieces as people wanted at once. 
Um, so those are some of the pieces. And last thing I wanted to leave you with are just some first steps. So I suggest that you identify portfolios that you like in a bio. If you start with the Catalyst site, but also if you Google ePortfolio Gallery, most of the major programs in the country maintain an ePortfolio Gallery where students have shared their portfolios. And you can look at them by discipline, you can look at them by department, you can look at them by institution, and you need to see, what do you like? What do you like that's going on that you want to do? You want to look at portfolios that already exist on your own campus. What do you like? What do you want to, you know, what do you want to bring from department to department? Um, I also suggest a work group to share and discuss and identify what you value. So it's not just one person, but it's a shared conversation. Um, also reading the literature. There is a whole literature that exists around ePortfolio. If I understand time constraints, I understand all of that. But as is possible, you know, could you have a reading group? talking about what's going on on other campuses. Um, and then thinking about your goals for faculty and for students, um, and going through that process. And how you're gonna talk from department, how are you gonna negotiate the conversation from department to department of what those portfolios look like and, and how that happens. That is easily done, but you need to actually have the conversation. Um, how are you gonna support it? What's that gonna look like? Are you gonna have paid professional development open to everybody? Are you gonna have course release? Are you, what is it? Are you gonna have class, smaller class size of students with e-portfolios? What, what are the models of support that are available? Um, and it shouldn't be that Chrissy does everything. <laughs> but it also should be that faculty do everything. And it also shouldn't be that students just have to figure it out on their own. There needs to be a combination of resources that, that help everybody. Um, okay, and I will share this with you. Um, but I'm also happy if people are not pressed for time. I'm not pressed for time, so I'm happy to hang out. But I also know we were supposed to end at 3.30, and it's Friday. So I'm <laughs> ending at 3.40. So if you need to go, you can go. Um, but I'm happy to hang out for questions. So Thanks. So Thank you. So yeah, yeah. when did you hire a full-time e-portfolio guru in 2001? I would have to double check that. I believe 2002. I think, if I'm remembering correctly, in 2001, two of our faculty who led the research team kind of shared that role. They weren't actually called the portfolio director, but they shared that role the first year. And then I believe we had our e-portfolio director by the next year. Oh, okay. Let's hope. Let's see what else I can get on the record. So how's your IT department? Are they more friendly for teaching than is your IT department more? It's a constant conversation. They are were. They by, are they led by an educator or are they led by an IT person? IT. Is there any, is there any, is there any part of your IT department that has is intermissions with the education process better? No, that's what our Center for Teaching and Learning does, because our Center for Teaching and Learning has a whole bunch of amazing instructional design people <laughs> who can talk technology. How many that's a bunch. Um, with actual degrees in the instructional design, sure. maybe three. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh my God. All but all yes, all a number. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Do you have questions? No. Sure. <laughs> I, I'm obviously an edge. Well, <laughs> so.